it isn't uncommon to find old teapots in an elderly home. But unlike other teapots, this one is not ordinary. It was discovered by a guest while cleaning out her grandmother's place. On the bottom of the teapot is a signature from George Orr, an American ceramic artist and the self-proclaimed Mad Potter of Biloxi in Mississippi. He is considered by some as the precursor to the American Abstract Expressionism movement. There are some chips on the pot's rim, but overall it is a very neat piece, which is a reflection of Orr's fascinating works. This teapot being one of George Orr's finest works, also being in such a pristine condition, shoots up its valuation at auction to be as much as 15000 in today's market. It's a good piece. It's a very nice piece. When you hear Wizard of Oz, most people automatically think that's one of the best movies of all time. Truth be told, they are right. And today's guest's great-grandfather was one of the movie's earliest actors. The value that it could hold. When my grandfather passed away, it was willed to me. And here we have a wonderful photograph of your great-grandfather, and it's to your grandfather. Yes. And that face, who can forget that face? <laughs> Most people know him as Burt Lair. He played the role of the cowardly lion in the famous movie Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz is one of the earliest movies produced and was released in the year of 1939. Wizard of Oz was released in 1939 and has continued in popularity to its iconic status today. This is his script that he used on set. The script here is the one Burt used to play the Cowardly Lion, and it's one for the ages. As one of the few pieces of pure cinema back in the day, this script is surely going to be able to fetch at least... As far as scripts belonging to members of the cast, it doesn't get much better than the Cowardly Lion, and here it is. Obviously, this is a family heirloom. I wouldn't insure it for anything less than $150,000. It's uh, definitely a lot more than I thought it was going to be valued at, and insurance is a necessity. It is, definitely, <laughs> yes. definitely. Well, thank you very much. Only a few people in the world can boast of being one of the most resilient entrepreneurs ever. Colonel Sanders, the founder of KFC, was one of those people. As we can see, today's guest shows us a suit and a signed photo belonging to Colonel Sanders. From 75 to 1980, uh, we lived right next to Colonel Sanders. Perhaps the most surprising story behind how our guest got these items is that according to the guest, Colonel Sanders slept in their basement, despite being a big shot. As we can see, the suit still maintained its quality after all these years. And also, the painting exudes elegance and shows it was painted by an expert. It's no wonder that for a piece that was worn by such a resilient man and that also depicts him, these items are valued at... It was actually a charity auction. Uh, one of the suits auctioned off for $80,000. Wow. But, they, but she told me that was for charity, so it probably would have went for more. Um, she did say that this it valued at between thirty and $50,000. I was not expecting, I had no idea. This stucco head, dating back to the Mayan civilization from 600 to 900 AD, has a remarkable history. It was removed from the facade of a building, likely in Mexico. And this came into Europe probably sometime 1920s, 1930s. The guest's grandfather, a third-generation dealer in Austria. Uh, they confiscated everything he owned, and he escaped with this piece and a few other pieces. It was later passed down to the guest's father and then to the guest. Despite its age, the stucco head is in remarkable condition, with traces of polychrome still visible. It's rare to find such a fragile piece intact, as many similar pieces are often broken and restored. The delicate balance and the sensitivity of the facial features of the stucco head add to its aesthetic appeal and value. This stucco head is estimated to be worth between... I think this is a twenty dollars to $30,000 object. Wow. At first glance, these photographs might look ordinary, but there's nothing ordinary about them. These photographs were given to the guest by her father. What makes these photographs unique is that they are personally autographed by Babe Ruth, a professional American baseball player who achieved great fame as a slugging outfielder for the New York Yankees. Babe Ruth was a friend of the guest's uncle and aunt, and they took a lot of photographs together back in the day. Set in the middle of these photographs is a large 14 by 11 photograph. 
Another interesting aspect of these photographs is their authenticity evident from the unusual autographs. But I've never seen a Babe Ruth as a three-year-old photo inscribed, and what an inscription this is. These photographs are also well-preserved. For a legend like Babe Ruth, who is arguably considered one of the greatest baseball players in history, it is not far-fetched that these photographs hold a high valuation of... Value-wise, I think that they would sell for between $25,000 and $30,000 for the group. <laughs> so what would Herbie and Gertie say about this? Sell them! <laughs> This pear-shaped vase, passed down from the guest's great-grandfather on their father's side, is a treasured family heirloom that has been in their possession since 1970. This vase is of Chinese origin, specifically from the Qing Dynasty. And it's actually imperial. Done at the imperial kilns in Jingdezheng, right outside of modern-day Shanghai. Identified as an imperial piece, this vase is distinguished by its classic shape high-quality glaze, and a rain mark on the base indicating it was made during the reign of Emperor Yang Zhang. Yang Zheng was an emperor that had a very short reign from 1723 to 1735. Despite some dark patches on the glaze, which suggest a slight misfiring during production, this vase is considered rare and valuable due to its quality, condition, rarity, and provenance. Reflecting the current strong demand for Chinese art made by imperial kilns in the market, the appraiser estimates that this vase could fetch between... About $30,000 to $50,000. You're kidding me. No. This collection of Le Maitre de la Fiche, acquired almost 20 years ago from an auction in Paris, represents a complete set of 256 posters in pristine condition. Originally issued as a collector's edition, these posters are smaller, more easily handled versions of the original billboard-sized posters, featuring works by renowned artists such as... There's some works by Toulouse-Lautrec. There's some works by Alphonse Mucha. There's some works by Jules Charest, And a poster by Steinlin. Each poster in the collection bears a faint embossed stamp. And every single one of them will have that embossed stamp, and that will tell you that it's part of the series. The guest acquired the entire collection for $8,000, and their exceptional condition, with wax paper and portfolio sleeves, adds to their value and rarity. Despite being reproductions, these posters are highly sought after by collectors and dealers alike, as they were printed between 1896 and 1900 making them artifacts of the same era as the originals. At auction, a set in lesser condition could fetch between... Would sell for $40,000, $45,000. Oh my God. <laughs> the story of this cane begins in the Civil War, when a relative from the guest's father's side fought for the North and was captured by the Confederate Army. Joseph Nelson found himself in the infamous Rebel Prison No. 4 in Danville, Virginia. Injured during his escape, Joseph crafted a cane from a tree and marked it with his daring escape tail. Under the cloak of darkness, Joseph and his comrades carved their escape, leaving behind a trail of pictures and names. Kane recounts their daring escape, including surprising the guards and traveling over 600 miles through challenging landscapes. The cane tells of their daring escape, surprising the guards and crossing over 600 miles of harsh terrain. Joseph's survival amidst snow and storms culminated in a reunion with his Union comrades in 1864, immortalized in the Keynes carvings. Authenticity of Joseph's story can be verified by using online archives. Civil War canes are common, but this one stands out as a uniquely rare historical treasure. I think this is probably a $5,000 to $7,000 cane at auction. It is one of the best Civil War canes I've ever seen. Thank you. The guest's grandmother's husband assembled this toy train collection between two world wars. It was packed away in 1928 and remained untouched for 70 years. The collection includes trains from renowned British makers like... Hornby, you've got Bassett Loke, you've got Leeds, the, the top three, really, of the locomotive mm. and um, rolling stock makers. Representing the history of the British toy train industry. Backlock, inspired by German toy train makers like Marklin and Carette, that was so successfully exporting into, into the UK, 
um, that he looked at that and he said, hmm, perhaps I can do a bit of that. Which later supplied trains to be retailed by Hornby. The collection includes a backlock 440 locomotive in tender and mint condition, likely untouched for decades, and a clockwork locomotive from Hornsby's early years, around 1920 to 1922. The appraiser estimates that the collection could fetch around... 10,000 pounds. You did? Mm. And I mean, I, I may be a tad conservative on that considering its pristine condition and historical significance in the British toy train industry. During a visit to Vienna in the 1980s, the guest was captivated by a stunning peacock feather brooch displayed in a shop window. Every time I passed, I stopped to sort of gasp and say how wonderful it was. And on the third day, my husband said he was going to buy it for me. The brooch's lifelike qualities and its ability to tremble realistically, a technique known as entremblant, is really impressive. Diamonds, sapphires, and a central cabochon emerald further enhance the piece's beauty. The brooch has similarities to the work of Boucheron, a renowned Parisian jeweler. It resembled a central element from Boucheron's question mark necklace, crafted in silver gold in 1883. Based on its quality, its estimated value is around... 25,000 pounds. Really? The guest brought in a remarkable collection of treen, wooden items crafted from mulberry wood. It is immediately recognized as birdolatry, souvenirs with a unique connection to William Shakespeare. The pieces had been passed down through her husband's family, and they were particularly fond of the intricate turning on the salt cellars. Shakespeare, it turned out, had planted a mulberry tree on his property, New Place in Stratford-upon-Avon. Some 200 years later, a new owner, tired of the constant stream of visitors drawn to the tree, had it chopped down. And he chopped up the trunk and the logs, and they were dispersed amongst local wood turners and carvers. The collection includes two exquisite examples of bardolatry, a writing box featuring Shakespeare's coat of arms and portrait with compartments for ink and pens, and a snuff box with a relief carving of Shakespeare's face that requires twisting his head to open. Both pieces displayed a beautiful patina, a mark of age that collectors highly value. The writing box was valued at around... 4,000 pounds. The salt cellars at 2,000 pounds each, and the snuff box at 2,500 pounds, bringing the total to a staggering... Something like 8,500 pounds. That's amazing. I had no idea. <laughs> The guest brought a collection of memorabilia that belonged to her mother, Jackie Mogridge, a pioneering pilot who served in the Air Transport Auxiliary, ATA, during World War II. Her desire to fly commercially led her to England in 1938, where she attended the Whitney Aeronautical College in Oxford. However, the growing need for ferry pilots during the war presented an opportunity for Jackie. This blue book contained crucial information on various aircrafts, including takeoff and landing speeds, as pilots were expected to fly a wide range of planes. Following the war, Jackie continued her flying career, joining the RAF Air Reserve and eventually landing a commercial pilot job with Channel Airways. ATA memorabilia, particularly items belonging to a distinguished pilot like Jackie Mogridge, were extremely rare. While the guest had no intention of selling the collection at auction, its potential value is between and it could easily make between 30 and 40,000. Diamond Ring features lab-grown square or rectangular diamonds set closely together without metal around them. It's replicating the vintage or art deco aesthetic with enhanced brilliance. The guest found this ring while hunting for old bottles by the Milwaukee River. It's a man-made diamond ring. The center stone looks like a French-cut sapphire but is actually a synthetic one with the same properties as natural sapphire and it's man-made. However, the diamonds are real, as is the metal around it. And the metal around it is white gold, done in beautiful piercing work. Originating in the 17th century, they regained popularity in the Art Deco era. The guest found this ring together with 39 other rings. The diamond ring holds its worth as the appraiser values the item, that auction is worth between $150 and $250. Okay, thank so you. I think I'll go down by the river. Thank you so much for coming to the Antiques Roadshow. The guest presented a captivating work of art, 
an intricately carved sculpture crafted from lime wood. Inheriting it from their father, who most likely acquired it at a dispersal sale near Manchester, the guest was eager to learn more about it. Upon closer examination, several key elements served as clues to the artwork's age and artistic style. The presence of ho-ho birds, a whimsical design element characteristic of the Rococo period, placing the creation date around 1730 to 1740. Further enriching the scene was a central tableau depicting a late 17th or early 18th century ship. Drawing upon these insights, the estimated date of the piece's date falls between 1740 and 1760. At auction, its value is around... Six to nine thousand pounds on this. Cool. Three years ago, at a garage sale, the guest bought it for $25. It is a tollware container used for storing important documents. Tollware, also known as Japanware, refers to items made of thin metal in New York State. Various painting schools or shops decorated tin objects with hand-painted designs, including floral or geometric motifs, often with hinged lids and locks for security. It is popular in the 19th century. We can see the details of the box. Wonderful bright flowers. You have these green and yellow leaves. And in the background, this purple color. Examining the box, much of it appears to be missing, significantly impacting its value. This box typically boasted painted swags on the ends and intricate decorations on top. With its intricate designs and historical significance, the appraiser values the item. This box is easily worth in the, in the range of about $1,100 to $1,400, about no $1,400, yeah. Wow. <laughs> this piece is called an architect's table, which was gifted to the guest. When this piece was made about 1725, 1730, it was a brand new form of furniture. It was an elegant, high-style piece of furniture, which the table extended to make a larger, flat area. It can be turned into a little lactern, and there are lots of cubby holes in it. Underneath this piece is a great spot for storage and little side panels which open up for drawers. There are three graduated doors to store a lot of things. This piece features a decoupage-like wallpaper in the inside space. And there are details on this piece which really make it elegant. And I wanted to just draw attention to the three Corinthian columns across the front. It has reeded columns taper, which makes the form light, and the wood is burled veneers. They spared no expense when it came to the materials used for this piece, and despite not being in vogue anymore, would still auction for... If this were to come to auction, we'd put a conservative estimate of four to 6000 If you're insuring it, I would say twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 for a piece like this. The guest inherited an antebellum slave journal from their father, who collected black history books. He acquired it from a bookstore in Nashville for $50 in the 1960s. The journal documents the life of Creed, a slave, from 1824 to 1860 noting his work on the farm, his skills, family, and even his trip to Washington, D.C. When Daniel Graham, the slaveholder, went to Washington as the assistant treasurer of the United States, Creed was the main gardener and market man. The journal contains entries for over 70 slaves, including vaccination records, highlighting the humanity and daily lives of the enslaved individuals. Our guest intends to research and find the families of the slaves mentioned in the journal to share stories about their ancestors. The appraiser values this antebellum slave journal at? In the range of fifteen to $20,000. Okay. You'd want this insured for in the kind of $25,000. Okay. The guest presented a Vermont militia coat. It has these wonderful Vermont buttons. This coat is a historical military garment that dates back to the late 18th and early 19th centuries. The coats were worn by members of the Vermont Militia local military force that played a role in the American Revolutionary War. The coats were made of wool and featured distinctive colors and designs that identified the wearer as a member of the militia. The piece often had Vermont buttons and epaulets and was worn with a tricorn hat. This piece is a symbol of the state's military history and heritage, with its value estimated to be... And I think this is probably $25,000 to $30,000. Oh, 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 my God! Oh, my God! Thank you! I had no idea! <laughs> 
This stunning painting by W.H.D. Corner, acquired by the guest's father in the early 1970s, is a remarkable piece of Western-themed art. W.H.D. Corner, born in 1878, was known for his illustrations in the Saturday Evening Post, was a self-taught artist who became an expert in Western history, tools, and dress. The painting, likely completed in early 1935 or late 1934, showcases Corner's attention to detail, with elements like the hanging chili peppers, which are known as ristras, the hat, the kerchief, even this wonderful belt with these silver medallions. Reflecting his meticulous research into Western culture, the piece, oil on canvas, was created by joining two stretched canvases, a unique aspect that adds to its charm and character. The painting's signature corner style and dramatic composition suggest a scene of imminent conflict, possibly a shootout, adding to its narrative power. At auction, this stunning painting is valued at around... I would expect the price to be around $150,000. Really? Extra. The guest shared a heartfelt story about her attachment to a chest once owned by a lady she worked for. After the lady passed away, her daughter gifted the chest to the guest. The chest was adorned with remarkable paintings depicting various hunting dogs. Upon closer inspection, it was noted that the chest lacked dovetails and was glued together, indicating it was likely crafted in the late 19th or early 20th century. Even though it tried to replicate an antique appearance with carved and chipped details, the chest was originally made from walnut. While a plain walnut cabinet might typically only fetch for around $200 at auction, the addition of the painted scene significantly increased its worth to be around... Could sell for easily $2,000 at okay, auction okay. in terms of value and possibly even more. The guest's great-grandfather was a missionary to Haines, Alaska in the 1890s, and these masks have been in the family since then. The masks are believed to be from the Tlingit tribe. These date to the 1700s. Oh my. Making them extremely rare and valuable. This mask on the left depicts a wolf, a revered animal symbolizing strength and hunting prowess. The mask on the right likely represents an ancestor or guardian figure. Both masks are shamanic, used in spiritual rituals to connect with the natural and spiritual worlds. The use of natural pigments and materials such as cedar or spruce wood adds to their authenticity and value. The appraiser estimates that the wolf mask could sell for around $75,000, while the guardian mask could fetch around $175,000. We never no. see. <laughs> <laughs> the 1903 folk art presentation plaque is a remarkable testament to craftsmanship and storytelling. During the evaluation, a special folk art piece is shown, bought 25 years ago at an auction in Poughkeepsie, New York. It's made of a kind of strong wood and has pictures of bears on toilets. The person checking it really likes how unique it is, saying it would appeal to different kinds of people, like plumbers and folks who collect old pictures. It's gotten rusty over time. This amazing thing was made by a person from Germany who moved to America. You'll notice the bears carved in the style of Germany's Black Forest. There's even two bears in a bathtub, and at the very top, there's a picture of the man. While examining the item, the appraiser said, Now easily at auction, because of the cross appeal, because it's a great piece of folk art, this piece would be worth easily $4,000 to $6,000. That's hard to believe. This mouse organ has a unique history once belonging to the legendary Johnny Cash, known as the Man in Black. The owner recalls a memorable encounter with Johnny Cash at the Apollo Theater in Glasgow in 1984. I was sitting right in the front row, he called me out and he held me down his mouth organ. I was shocked myself as he bent down the stage and threw it down to us. Johnny Cash, a music icon with hits spanning multiple genres, including country and rock and roll, used this organ during his performances in the 1950s and 1960s. While the organ is not signed by Cash, its provenance as a concert-used item adds to its value. Given the passionate following of Johnny Cash fans, at auction, this mouse organ could fetch upwards of... 
certainly be upwards of a thousand pounds perhaps two thousand maybe more is it something that you're thinking of maybe selling or no, are you going to hand selling, it down no that, that'll go for the long sleep alone with me the guest brought an inscribed card with a box that was presented to her great grand aunt it is an official looking box having the department of justice on it and underneath it is written robert kennedy he was an American politician and lawyer known by his initials RFK and served as the 64th United States Attorney General. He was also the U.S. Senator from New York from January 1965 until his assassination on June 1968, when he was running for the Democratic presidential nomination. Inside the box is an official card of the Attorney General in Washington. And it says, Dear Mrs. Wright, we all miss you terribly. Come back quickly. Affectionately, Robert Kennedy. It was a beautiful sentiment Robert had sent to her, which was not something a government official of that caliber do often. Unfortunately, the condition of it is not 100%. Right, there yeah. There was some staining that has affected the signature and the actual inscription. The sentiment was heartfelt, and the person who signed it is super important. Although this piece was not in 100% condition, but because of the writer's reputation, it is valued at... At auction, I would say a conservative estimate would be four to $600 for the note. Okay. Today's guest shows us one of the portraits drawn by one of the world's best painters in the 19th century, Sir Lawrence Alma Tadema. This painting represents the portrait of our guest's ancestor. And according to the appraiser, the guest's ancestor was a very important man to Sir Lawrence. His dealer, Gambart, yeah. about whom, incidentally, my father wrote a book. <laughs> we can see there is also another painting here by Sir Lawrence, which is painted in complete white. The painting that represents the guest's father indicates that he was doing an engraving for Tadema, which at the time was a very important job. For an artist of the caliber of Tadema, this painting will surely fetch a hefty price at auction and is valued at... Uh, so I'm going to say one to two thousand pounds on that. In recent times, he's become very valuable again. He holds the record for uh, a Victorian painting cool. at thirty-six million dollars. I'm going to put it at two to three hundred thousand pounds. Oh. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Gifted by a dear friend, this vibrant rug adorns the owner's wall. I, I love the colors in it. I, you know, I like color, obviously. Oh. Crafted in the Caucasus region. It's known as a chichi, boasting bold geometric designs. Measuring a charming 3x3 three three feet, its small size enhances the beauty of its detailed patterns and dates back to the 1920s. Vibrant colors captivate, weaving a spell of love and fascination. Its age adds to its allure, making it a vintage and valuable treasure estimated at auction for... Probably talking about a valuation of 1000 to $1,500. Wow, that is incredible. This jadeite pendant, estimated to be from the early 20th century, features a motif of peaches, oranges, and songbirds, symbolizing prosperity. And Chinese people love them. Okay. Yes, it's very auspicious. Okay. And uh, oranges too. Okay. And the songbirds, I think it's here, means marital harmony. The pendant's vibrant colors and intricate carving make it a valuable piece, with the pink stones identified as tourmaline. Chinese art and antiques, particularly jade items, are in high demand, suggesting a promising value for this pendant. With its auspicious symbolism and excellent condition, at auction, this jadeite pendant can fetch an impressive... Uh, conservative prices, but at the auction, it should do ten to 15000 Oh my yes. word! <laughs> You should be careful. Yes. These portrait miniatures of Frederick Seymour and Prudence Minor, painted by an American artist, Mary Way, are treasured family heirlooms with a fascinating history. Frederick Seymour, a sea captain and merchant, and his wife, Prudence, lived in Hartford. And their portraits have descended through generations since they were painted in the late 18th century. Mary Way, known for her versatility in portrait miniatures, uniquely specialized in dressed miniatures. And what is so marvelous about her work is she's the only American miniaturist that we know of that worked in a three-dimensional manner hmm. called dressed miniature. Prudence's portrait showcases intricate details like her transparent hat and gauze dress with embroidered flowers, demonstrating Mary Way's exceptional skill and attention to detail. 
These miniatures, though not in their original frames, are exemplary of Mary Way's talent, and these miniatures are estimated to be valued between... I would conservatively estimate that these would be in the twenty dollars to $30,000 range. Yikes. Nice to Evans. know. This pansy brooch, passed down through generations, dates back to around the turn of the 20th century, between 1900 and 1910. Featuring three beautifully enameled pansies, it's a rare find compared to the more common single pansy brooches of that era. And this one also has a great enamel coloring to it. The brooch is adorned with old European cut diamonds, typical of the period, with one of the pansies designed to move, symbolizing drops of dew. Despite its age, the enamel has survived remarkably well, showcasing... My grandmother wore it, and then my mother wore it. They took excellent care of it. Yeah. That's great. Thanks. The brooch bears the signature of Tiffany Studios, possibly designed by Louis Comfort Tiffany himself. While smaller pansy brooches of this type typically sell for around $5,000, this larger, more intricate piece with high-quality diamonds could fetch between... You could easily get fifteen dollars to $20,000 for this. Okay. Yeah. That's excellent. The guest's parents acquired these enamel porcelain on copper plaques during a trip to China in the late 1970s. These plaques, depicting a scholar with an attendant, are examples of Canton enamel. And these are wonderful examples of the relationship that the East and West had. Despite some damage, such as surface scratching and a fracture in the enamel, these plaques are considered to be of high quality and are not common tourist decorative items. The subject matter and size of these plaques suggest they may have been intended for use as either a hanging painting or an insert into furniture in China. These plaques serve as a beautiful example of the artistry and craftsmanship of Canton enamel, reflecting a period of cultural exchange and artistic collaboration between China and the West. In terms of value, each plaque is estimated to be worth between... An auction estimate of five to $8,000 on it. Wow. Is this for the pair? or This is for a single. Wow. So a pair, I would put an auction estimate at twelve to 18000 these Courier and Ives prints were gifted to the guest's father upon his retirement from the Smithsonian Institute in the early 1970s and passed down to the guest about 15 years ago. Courier and Ives, the prominent publisher of prints in the 19th century, specialized in hand-colored lithographs with... The size is called small folio, and they've been copied over and over and over again. The prints, dating back to the 1870s, depict scenes from the American West reflecting the era's great western migration in the California gold rush. The print's scarcity and subject matter make them more desirable among collectors, particularly the Yosemite Valley, which features the pioneer cabin and is highly regarded. In terms of value, the prints are estimated to be worth between $5,700. Wow, that's great. <laughs> Despite their monetary value, these prints reflect a period of American exploration and migration. The guest's fascination with Muhammad Ali stems from his admiration for the boxer's impact on sports and society, particularly his activism and resilience. Acquired at charity auctions, these photos capture key moments in Ali's career and personal life, reflecting... The earliest photo from 1964 shows Ali with the Beatles taken when Sonny Liston refused to meet the band, leading to this iconic moment. Another photo depicts Ali's controversial knockout of Liston in 1965, known as the Phantom Punch Fight. The final photo is from the historic fight of the century in 1971, the first bout between Ali and Frazier, which ended in Frazier's victory. These oversized reprint photographs were typical charity auction items. You have these what look like signatures here, but these are reproductions. Okay. While the signatures on the photos are not original, the Muhammad Ali signature on one of them is authentic, dating from later in Ali's life. With the Beatles photo valued at... In terms of value, this one would be between $1,000 and $1,500. The Ali signature photo at... Between $2,000 and $3,000. And the fight of the century photo at... The century, again, about $1,500 to $2,000. Okay, okay. And they have given me a lot of joy, um, but no, they're not worth more than $4,000. <laughs> <laughs> 
Acquired by the guest's mother at a church rummage sale in the 1970s, this Van Briggle pottery piece is a testament to her interest in collecting. Van Briggle, known for his innovative pottery designs, worked in Colorado Springs from around 1900 until his death in 1904. Then his wife Anna continued until around 1912 or 1913 where she sold the company to some investors and is still in business today. This particular piece, dated 1903, bears a double A mark for Artis and Anne, signifying the period when the couple worked together, creating some of their most creative and beautiful pots. The vessel, featuring embossed floral designs, is painted in matte glazes, with blue flowers set against a white background and additional color on the stems. Only a small percentage of Van Briggle pottery pieces are dated during his lifetime, and even fewer are painted with three colors, making this piece exceptionally rare. The appraiser conservatively estimates its value at auction to be between... I would estimate it for between $25 and $3,500. Wow! Okay, and probably more like $3,000 to $4,000. Awesome! That's wonderful! My mom would be thrilled!